Coming up on Need to Know, as of now, she's the only candidate in the race for Rochester mayor with an actual platform. That's according to mayoral candidate Rachel Barnhart. She joins us to talk problems, priorities, and plans for Rochester. That's next. Also on the show, he's a pioneering researcher in the intriguing and at times controversial world of stem cell biology and medicine. Where the stem cell movement is heading and new discoveries you need to know about. Stay with us. Need to Know starts right now. Reducing property taxes by 50%, increasing funding for child care, and offering fiber internet for all city homes. These are just a few of the priorities for Rochester mayoral candidate Rachel Barnhart. The former journalist and New York State Assembly candidate joins former Rochester police chief and current Monroe County legislator James Shepard in the race for the city's top seat. But Barnhart says when it comes to an actual plan to turn the city around, she's the candidate with an agenda. Joining me in the studio to share that agenda is the Chief Development Officer of Settlement Houses of Rochester Foundation and mayoral candidate Rachel Barnhart. And welcome back to the program. We were talking before about how a year ago this month you were here and we were talking about media coverage yes. and media issues. So nice to be here again. It's good to have you here. And we'll jump right in. I know a lot of uh, aspects of your platform have been covered quite a mm -hmm. bit this month, this week, I should say. You were on connections with Evan Dawson earlier in the week. Uh, but there's one issue I want to start with, and it's yes. something that you've made a priority for your campaign, and that is the plan to reduce property property taxes by 50%. And you've said on your campaign site, this won't go into effect for three years and that you want a full reassessment cycle before this would take place. So just so viewers get an understanding, how would this work? It's important to reduce property taxes for several reasons. First, we have to fix a distortion in the market. We know that every single developer and company that comes to town gets a property tax break. Meanwhile, the rest of us are left holding the bag, low and middle income homeowners. Half of our homeowners in the city of Rochester earn less than $50,000 a year. More than a quarter of them are paying more than a third of their income in housing costs. I met so many homeowners who are having trouble paying for new roofs, getting home equity loans in upside down mortgages. My plan would fix a distortion in the market by offering this benefit to absolutely everyone. Second, we have to attract and retain new families and businesses. If Rochester is going to be competitive, we need to lower our tax rate. We need to have this make economic sense because people right now with choices are not choosing us. And finally, Rochester, if we cut our taxes, will be in line with Buffalo. Buffalo residents pay far less than Rochester does. Why? Because they get $200 more per person in state aid and don't have to give their school as much money. We must fix this disparity because it hits us right in the wallet. You mentioned the three-year plan. Right. Long-range fiscal planning is key here. We need time to put money away into a dedicated fund to absorb the revenue hit. But it's our feeling that, that it won't take very long to reduce that gap with new investment. So this is a win for low and middle, home co low and middle to income homeowners, also a win for businesses, you say, that, that mm -hmm. want to relocate into the city. But I want to know, to what degree could this be a potential downside for s city service jobs, city sure. employees, things that could be affected by this reduction, sanitation, public yep. transportation, and so on? We are adamant that with long-range fiscal planning, we can cover this gap and make absolutely no cuts to services. Some possible sources of revenue are consolidating the water system, asking the state for more aid, budget efficiencies without cutting vital services, and growing our tax base. This can work. What I've done is offer a roadmap. And yes, there will be critics saying, this cannot be done. But what I say to them is, 
How would you like to get there? I'm open to ideas, but this is where we have to go to create jobs, to reduce poverty, to make Rochester a growing, thriving place where people want to be. And how do we grow the tax base? How, how would you do that? Well, if we make Rochester very competitive in terms of property taxes, people will come back. I don't need everybody to come back. We just need some people to come back. And even with moderate growth, that could be millions and millions of dollars of impact on our city. And you mentioned the consolidation with the Monroe County Water System. Have you talked to any folks from that organization to to share your plan, to get feedback, to see if there's buy-in? Well, I think it's a little premature right now, and I would be surprised if the Water Authority wants to inject itself into a mayoral race. But I am confident that Monroe County would work with us on this plan. And the state right now is encouraging consolidation and would pay for such a study. And let me tell you, we would have to do due diligence to make sure city taxpayers and city workers are protected. So for people who hear that and they hear, okay, how would this consolidation work? And they, they can't really wrap their heads around the savings well, effect of that. We don't know that. how do it would work. We would have to do a major study. It would take time to do that. And again, we'd have to make sure that the city would be protected well into the future and have representation into the future on the water system. But right now, the city and the county share water yeah. quite a bit. I'm also suggesting that we collaborate with Monroe County on child care. Local Democrats have made child care a, a political foot. Ball. Right now, Democrats in the county legislature, including Jim Shepard, are holding up capital improvement projects because they want more daycare slots. What they're proposing would only provide a handful more daycare slots. I am proposing that the city step up, if we're serious about reducing poverty, that we step up and provide more child care funding for an additional 1,000 children. This would not have a huge budget impact, and I'm not calling for more spending. This would be less than 2% of the budget. This is about priorities, and the best part about this plan is is the state provides matching funds. So we could yeah. potentially impact far more than 1,000 children. We know child care helps people get on the path to getting out of poverty. This should be a priority, and frankly, I think it's a travesty that our local elected officials haven't proposed this before. You mentioned partnering with Monroe County on that effort. I, I also want to talk with you about that when it comes to mm -hmm. education in general. Mm -hmm. you, you support a countywide mm -hmm. school system. You said that there's no political will to do that in Monroe County. It seems issues of racial and economic mm -hmm issues that we're having in schools right now, these disparities could in fact be addressed with something like a countywide system. Right. If that's not on the table, in what ways do you see yourself partnering with Monroe County Executive sure. Cheryl Denoffel to really start to look at these things and try to come up with concrete plans to better address them? Sure. You mentioned I do, I do support a countywide school district. I believe that is the moral position to take on this issue. I went to a segregated school. I went to John Marshall High School. I'm the daughter of two city school educators. I understand the impact of impoverished schools. We know that when schools get above 40% poverty, that achievement starts to decline. Concentrated poverty is a huge issue. So the question becomes, how do we make our schools more economically diverse? Of course, I'll support any and all voluntary integration programs, because I absolutely don't think that if I become mayor, me standing up there count calling for a countywide school district will in any way be effective. I'm stating my support for it, but mm -hmm. I'm saying that I think we need to find some other strategies here that are practical and realistic. There are two things we have to do. Since we know poverty is a problem right. and directly linked to achievement, we have to get our residents out of poverty. That is why I have proposed child care. That is why I have proposed reducing property taxes to get more businesses to come to town, to provide relief to struggling poor homeowners, and to provide more jobs. We have 14% unemployment rate in this city. That is completely unacceptable. The other thing we have to do is attract and retain families to Rochester. I know many families that are for, they feel they're forced to leave because of the school system. If we can create a critical mass, strategically target them and say, look, I know you don't want to be first. I know you're scared of sending your child to a city school district. But what if we get them all in a room and say, everybody, let's jump together. I think that could work. And I will be the biggest cheerleader for the city school district and a strong public school system to make that happen. I'm going to piggyback off of that because I know you said mayoral control is off the table. You want to partner with the city school system. That's correct. But I also understand, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Rachel, that you would not fight to reduce the city's funding of the $119 no. million dollars that, that directly no, goes to I the city not. school system. But I want to ask. It, by it, law, you can't but, either. But so I want to know. It, in partnering with them, in what ways do you want to, do you plan, if elected, to hold the city school system accountable? 
spending is incredibly important. I spent an entire year uh, holding the city school district accountable on spending. I exposed administrative bloat. I exposed other kinds of spending issues. Certainly the mayor can use her bully pulpit to talk about spending issues in the city school district. I think that's appropriate, but I don't want to have an antagonistic relationship. I want to have a relationship with the city school district in which we do everything we can to promote it, to reduce poverty, and to get families to try this system. And I will partner with them, bring experts to the table, and make sure that we reach that goal. Economic diversity is key. I'm going to jump to public safety now. Mm -hmm. We're jumping around here. And so a few things that you're interested in doing if elected. Uh, you want to make sure that the Rochester Police Department is fully staffed, make officers more visible by increasing walking beats, and open offices in each patrol section. This relationship, you know it, you've covered it, mm -hmm. it is frayed between police departments and communities, not just in Rochester, this mm -hmm. is happening around the country. In what ways do you see yourself as mayor working to bridge that divide? Well, true community policing does require a fully staffed police department. Residents need to have a relationship with, with police officers. I am calling for a reform of the civilian review board system. Right now, when someone has a complaint against an officer, we have a board made up of civilians that reviews that complaint. But the primary evidence that they use is based on the internal affairs report, which I think is very tainted. The police chief is the final arbiter. The police chief doesn't have to issue any kind of written decision. Yeah. They can just write sustained, unprovable, exonerated. I think we need more explanation from the police chief, and I think the police chief needs to be thoroughly removed from the process throughout. And um, finally, I believe that we need to resolve these complaints within 120 days. That is a reasonable time for citizens to get answers. A lot of this has to do with transparency, openness, and accountability. People want to know that if, if an officer does something, yeah. that they have recourse. And we are constricted by state law to some effect because uh, they do keep disciplinary records quiet. Uh, they can't be made public, but there are things that we can do to build that trust. All right. We have to close for now, but mm -hmm. a return invite is on the table for you uh, and for the other candidates in the 2017 mayoral race. Mayor Lovely Warren has yet to announce if she too will run. So for now, Rachel, I hope you and James Shepard will join me together on the program in the near future so we can further dig into the issue. So I thank you for your time thank today. You. To learn more about Rachel Barnhart's campaign, go to rachelformayor.com. Kidney disease, diabetes, cerebral palsy, genetic disorders. These are a few of the many afflictions that my next guest and his team at the University of Rochester Medical Center are most interested in navigating. But the navigation is just one part of the equation. Another is making discoveries that could possibly alter the treatment of health conditions with no sufficient therapies. His work spans everything from stem cell biology and medicine to research on drug repurposing. And he says it's all in an effort to make the world a better place. Place. Joining me now to share more about his research, work, and the future of stem cell medicine is Mark Noble, professor of genetics and neurobiology and anatomy at the University of Rochester Medical Center and director of the UR Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Institute. Welcome to the show. I should say welcome back. It's been a few years, so Thank welcome you. back. Thank you so much. So Mark, you are the epitome of a person that's difficult to keep up with because you wear many <laughs> different hats and do a number of different things in this field. And I've read that you've spent the core of your career in science focused on examining and understanding the unique properties of special cells. So to give viewers a better understanding of what you do, what are you looking for as a biomedical scientist? Well, what I'm personally looking for is treatments for these horrible afflictions for which we have no therapies at the moment. And in particular, what we're looking for is general principles that allow us to potentially treat multiple diseases. So you can approach this by working very hard on a particular disease, and, and that's what a lot of laboratories do, and it's a great way to do it. But if you can find the general principle, then you may have the opportunity to actually help a lot of people, as well as decreasing the cost of therapeutic development, because now you have a therapy that can be used over and over again. Can you give an example so viewers understand of, of when you've discovered something and, and you struck gold, so to speak? Well, it's a good time right <laughs> now. <laughs> so one of, one of the areas of research that we've recently published on is our work on a, a, a problem in disease which involves a part of the cell called a lysosome. 
So a lysosome is the stomach of the cell, and it, it really works like a stomach. It digests lipids and proteins, provides them as nutrients for the cell, and when it doesn't work properly, you have very serious problems. And what's become clear is that lysosome dysfunction is important in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and diabetes, but there's 40 to 50 diseases that are caused by mutations in proteins that need to function in the lysosome. And a lot of these diseases are just devastating. They kill kids within two or three years, and we have no treatments. So we decided to go after the worst of these diseases. And with a couple of absolutely spectacular students, Chris Fultz and Nicole Scott Hewitt, we were able to make some actually quite revolutionary discoveries of how to intervene in these diseases in a way that gives us access to multiple diseases. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do this by discovering new properties of existing drugs. So we shortened the road to exploring this clinically. And in collaborations with my colleague Chris Prichel, our hope that by working on the worst of these diseases, yeah. we would get insights relevant to other diseases. It looks like what we're working on may be very relevant to Parkinson's disease. Interesting. So this this ties into with the drug repurposing. Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about um, what what types of therapeutic benefits. I want to make sure we kind of drill down into this to get a better understanding. Um, have you found with what you've described? So. When we look at animal models for these diseases, there is one animal model that we particularly like to study because in it the mice are born normal, they get sick at day 20, they're dead at day 40. So you have a, a very nice timing in which to look at interventions. And we are able to uh, decrease, even prevent a lot of the damage in the central nervous system that occurs in this disease. We're able to improve what you'd call quality of life for these mice, improve their motor behavior, we extend their lifespan, and we do all of this without fancy techniques of, of gene therapy or cell transplantation. Now we're in a position to explore how these drugs might be combined with other drugs in ways that, that maybe we hope could help some of these kids. And in addition to the health benefits, are there financial benefits associated with something like that in terms of cost? Well, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry will tell you that it costs a billion dollars or more to develop a drug. And I believe, and others believe, that that can be greatly decreased. And that's one of the reasons why we take existing drugs and discover new properties of them. Because then we know the toxicology, we know the dosage, we don't have to do that stuff. We can focus on how we would use them for treating a disease for which they've never been used before. That decreases costs on one end. Because many of the drugs that we've discovered new uses of are actually generics. We can now explore how to bring them to the clinic at a decreased cost. And we, we have to decrease the cost of medical care. The, the, there was a very interesting editorial by one of the, the, the senior deans of oncology for the United Kingdom after one of the recent big cancer meetings. The big buzz these days in cancer research is getting the body's immune system to attack cancer cells. For a small fraction of people, this is curative. For a somewhat larger group of people, it can extend lifespan. But what Dr. Sakura said was that with the projected cost of these treatments, there's not enough money in the entire budget for the entire National Health Service of the entire United Kingdom just to treat the cancer patients. So we've got to do better than that. And that's one of the great advantages of this approach that, that I and many of my colleagues are taking. And I want to ask you, Mark, with, with drug repurposing and the right. approach that you're describing, is there a connection at all, you can school me on this, yeah. when it comes to stem cell research, stem cell biology, and medicine? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Everything we do is based on stem cells. So we use stem cells as a, as a discovery tool. And when we're trying to find a, a, a new approach to a disease, we'll choose an appropriate stem cell or, or other type of cell that can make cells of the body and use it as our target. Now, sometimes we're trying to improve its function, but in cancer, 
you have the stem cells, fundamentally the stem cells evil twin. So just like in the normal body, you may have a small population of stem cells that replenish the tissue. In cancers, many cancers have a small population of cancer stem cells that replenish the tumor and they're very resistant to therapy. So our goal there has been to discover pathways that distinguish the cancer stem cell from normal stem cells, to target those pathways, and to go in and use that as a means of therapeutic development. And that's been extraordinarily successful. I'm going to pull back just a little bit and, and touch upon something that uh, you were joking when you said this and I saw uh, a, a TEDx talk with you and you mm -hmm. said, hey, I have to keep it real. Stem cells are incredibly boring. And I know that that was, that was a right. joke that you were making. But for those who are watching right now and they're, and they're saying, I don't understand how this connects to me. I, I, cancer hasn't touched my family. Some of these things that they've mentioned may not have touched my family. Why is it important to understand how stem cells work and, and what's happening right now with this research? So w when, when you look at many of the diseases for which we have no therapies, cancer cells, for example, now that we understand about cancer stem cells, we have a therapeutic target that we can aim at. Moreover, what my team and I discovered about a decade ago was that many of the standard cancer therapies are more toxic for the normal precursor cells, stem cells and more restricted cells of the brain than they are toxic for cancer cells. So by going after ways of selectively targeting the cancer stem cells, we also are looking to develop therapies that are safer. So that's just cancer. But let's look at at the, if we look at lysosomal storage disorder, so disease group, we're very interested in the effect one in 80 to one in 100,000 children. That's not a large number of people, but it's a, it's a well-deserving population of people. Parkinson's disease afflicts 1.6% of the population. Alzheimer's even more than that. These are also diseases in which the lysosome, this organ of the cell, becomes dysfunctional and contributes to the disease process. Now that begins to affect a lot of people. And it's very hard to find a family in which these diseases of aging are not problematic. And, and, and I should say that a lot of the general principles that we study apply to aging in general, it appears. So that also makes it relevant. We're, we're, we're all touched by these in one way or another. For those watching, Mark, and they might be thinking, isn't there an ethical debate wrapped up with st the stem cell movement? How prevalent is that today, that, that debate that we heard so much about uh, when news right. really broke about stem cells? Right. The wonderful thing about science is that we're always moving forward. This is, this is what, it, it, I know it's very confusing for people when scientists disagree with each other, <laughs> but, but this is part of what we do because every day we're going in to try and find out how we were wrong about what we believed yesterday. So fields are always moving forward. And one of the spectacular advances in stem cell biology, and this is just, this is just so fantastic. I can take cells from your skin and I can put them through a sequence of steps in a tissue culture dish, and I can turn them into nerve cells. I can turn them into muscle cells. I can turn them into heart cells. I can turn them into the cells that produce insulin in the pancreas. And those cells all come from you. So the hope is that by using that kind of methodology, we can make cells where we don't even have to do immune suppression. Got it, so in that case then, you don't have to deal with the embryonic stem cells, correct? Where, where be, the field has, I'm not gonna say it's moved beyond that mm -hmm. because discovery is a continuum and the principles that we learn from studying embryonic stem cells provide the principles for doing this work on what we call induced, we call them induced pluripotent stem cells. So science always spans this complete continuum, but more and more the ability to derive important cell types from cells of someone's own body yeah. is becoming central to the research effort.
I know I'm jumping around a bit, but I'm going to go to something. Recently, you and fellow researchers at right. the University of Rochester Medical Center, you published a study in which you announced uh, you may have identified a new way uh, to help their body repair its own cells. We kind of touched upon this, which could lead to improved diagnoses and treatment of traumatic nerve injuries. Um, so I want to talk about this. This was in November when this came out, That's this study. Right. Uh, is, and I, I, I'm jumping around, but with drug repurposing and what you're doing and, and finding, is this relatively rare or is this something that's more common now? It, it's becoming very common. That, that initially, people who were doing this were concerned that in the end, we only have a small number of approved drugs we can work with, right? So, and we have all these problems we're trying to solve. But what's become very clear? We've known for a long time that drugs are dirty. They have what are called side effects. Well, sometimes those side effects may be main effects for purposes of another disease, and we can discover aspects of these drugs that nobody ever knew before. And that enables us to use them in new ways. So I think that the ability of a drug to get through all the tests that make it into a medicine is based in some respect on properties that we don't yet understand. And those properties can be, it appears, exploited for other purposes. Those of us who are doing this now are, are finding a lot of successes. So what, what is it for you that makes the work you do on a daily basis so exciting? What is, because I, I know you said, I mean, when I, I spoke with you in advance of our conversation and I could, I could tell that this is something that it's challenging but also exciting at the exact same time. I mean, it, is there something that you hope that you would say in the next five to ten years, uh, I hope that we can, my lab, that we can achieve this or find this or discover this? Oh, there's a, there's a lot. A lot of this work is heading towards clinical trials. And the opportunity to impact on someone else's life. Wow, what, and what's better than that? Yeah. That is, it's not the only reason to go into science, that, that you study science to make the universe a more beautiful place, by understanding the, these, you know, these incredible questions of, of how we go from a single cell to a you, right? I, what a wonderful problem to study. Well, I appreciate your time. We have to close for now, but we'll look forward to having you back on the show. In the near future, there's much to discover with you and your work and in your research. A special thank you to Mark Noble uh, for your time. I appreciate it. You can learn more about the work of Mark Noble and his team at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Just go to urmc.rochester.edu and search for Noble Labs in the search engine. And that wraps up this edition of Need to Know, Rochester's News Magazine. I'm your host, Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for joining me tonight and throughout the weekend here on WXXI-TV. And thank you for supporting public broadcasting. I'll see you next week.